Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Ram Das Fellowship live stream. So great to get together again. We meet every month to share wisdom with great teachers of our time, hopefully so that we can better navigate this human pr predicament that we all find ourselves in these times. And you all, you are you are the Ram Das Satsang, a group of folks with their hearts and minds and compasses pointed towards truth. And that is what Ram Das wanted for the future. He wanted satsang or community to continue. And that's what we've been doing in so many ways over the last two years. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jacqueline Dobrinska. I'm the Education and Community Outreach Director for Love Serve Remember Foundation. And tonight we're super honored to be joined by Sean Korn, who is an internationally acclaimed yoga teacher, author, public speaker. She's been at the forefront of yoga and activism and community service for 28 years. It's really great to be here with her. And our topic for tonight is Revolution of the Soul. We'll be exploring the intersection between yoga and inner work and justice and collective care and how to deepen um, our understanding of how to engage in this world that is changing so quickly. Uh, so we'll be together for 75 minutes, just a few logistics here if, for those of you especially tuning in for the first time. So the first half of our 75 minutes, Sean's going to talk and maybe do a little meditation. And then for the second half, it's an audience Q&A. So Gina's on the back end. She's watching all of the different channels. And you just type your question into wherever you are watching from, and she'll feed them to me, and then I'll ask Sean. So uh, stick around and make sure you can ask your questions at any time. So with that, I know we're all so used to be on the, being on these computers these days, but it's really nice to just take a pause to get out of the momentum and recognize your feet and your breath and the hundreds of people around the world who are joining together in this thing called community. So just take another deep breath. And from there, we will all welcome the amazing and beautiful Sean Korn. Thanks for being here. Jackie, thank you so much. I'm, I'm actually quite honored to be a part of this particular fellowship and to have that opportunity just to share, um, especially at a time like this that is so fraught with chaos and overwhelm and also with intense possibility and potential if we're committed to doing the inner work on ourselves and also holding each other lovingly and sometimes assertively accountable for the ways in which perhaps we contribute to the suffering of others. And so I'm I'm just very happy to be here. So thank you. So glad you're here. So glad you're here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So everyone, I I wish I could see your faces. I honestly wish that I we were in an environment live where I could actually see you, look in your eyes, ask you questions, see how you're feeling, how is your family, how is your life? Um, your breath, your body, all the things that you hold dear. Um, I'm very grateful for this medium. This is a medium that has kept us together over the last couple of years. And there are certainly pros and cons. And the cons, of course, is I cannot see you. But the gift is that we can uh, be together, stay connected, and listen deeply to these universal truths that remind us of our very essence. And so... I want to invite you first before I begin talking just to just to connect um, so you can get used to the sound of my voice and also to what my intentions are in being here. If it's appropriate, I want to invite you to sit up tall and close your eyes. If you're listening to this in a car um, or somewhere where you can't do that, it's absolutely fine. But just place maybe your hand on your heart for a moment just so that you can make that connection with yourself. And you can remind yourself of just to, to be present in this, in the Sangha, in this community. Now, as you ground down, lengthen the spine. And with your eyes closed, bring your awareness, if you can, inward. I want to ask you a question before we begin all of this. And it's a question that I ask myself every day as I sit in my own practice. Is how are you? How, how are you? How is your life? How is your family? How is your health? 
How has the past two years been for you? I know for all of us, we've experienced unimaginable loss and confusion and overwhelm and even death. A lot of disappointment, expectation, identities, shattered, dreams, halted. And at the same time, we're incredibly resilient human beings with all this possibility. We've gotten through. We've survived. We've thrived. We've raised our kids. We've earned the money. We did what needed to be done. And yet, very often in the busyness of keeping it all together and making sure everyone around us is okay, the first thing that often gets compromised is our willingness to touch in to the deepest, most tenderest parts of ourselves, that vulnerable place within, and ask ourselves that question, are you okay? And so just breathe into that for a moment, into whatever answer might arise for you. Whether the answer is, yeah, actually, I'm doing great. I am thriving and and feel inspired in my life at this time, or I'm challenged. I'm concerned, I'm scared, I'm disappointed. I don't trust the world in which I'm a part of right now. I feel like the foundation of our society feels fractured and indifferent. Without having any real attachment to the answer, of good or bad or right or wrong, just be with that answer. And to the moment that you get to answer this and be with yourself in a way that's in truth, Now, as you ground down, I want to invite you to place one hand right above your navel, which is at what's called the Manapura Chakra, the third chakra. You're going to place your other hand right over your heart center, the Anahata Chakra. And take a deep breath into your hands. Exhale it out through the mouth. You have your hands placed upon the energy in the third chakra of truth and of your other hand of the energy of love and my understanding of God or cosmic consciousness or what you want to call this divine energy is that it is truth and love as it dwells within and that which dwells within dwells within all. Everything that we need to know and the answers to all of our questions and prayers already exist within us. The only thing that blocks us from that divine knowing is life and trauma, insecurity and doubt, education, religion, politics, all the things that make up this life that tell us that we're something different than we truly are, influences the way in which we perceive ourselves and the world around us and impacts our relationship with the divine. So I invite you this moment just to connect with that source, whatever it is for you, knowing that you're not these bodies or the stories that you tell yourself are true, that you're not the fear or the insecurity or the doubt or the rage. You're not the heartbreak or the jealousy. And although these are aspects of our experience here upon this planet, they do not define us. We are light and we are love and we are immortal grace. And we are here to learn what love is. And in the process of learning what love is, we will be confronted what is perceived as its opposite, all that love is not. So take a deep breath into the center space. Exhale it out completely. And then finally, bring your awareness to the third eye center to the Ajna Chakra, to your intuition. Intuition is not a gift, it's a skill. And the only thing that blocks us from this internal intuitive knowing is our low self-esteem and all the ways in which we give away our power and all the ways in which we get our value from the outside in. When we do the inner work necessary and call our power back and know who we truly are, our hearts and our heads will be congruent. The truth of our soul will be known and the words in which we speak will be reflected of that knowing. And now place your palms into prayer. Calling in the God of your own unique understanding. Calling in your higher power, the creative consciousness, Mother Earth or the Holy Mother herself. Calling in the saints and the sages, the spirit guides and the angels. 
calling in the creator and all of our ancestors, we ask, may this moment be an opportunity for remembrance and awakening to occur in our body, mind, and spirit. May we have the willingness as we go forward to let go of everything that we think we know and orient towards the shadow self so that we can learn about the ways in which we are disconnected from our own highest grace. And in learning this, we can move back into wholeness. We ask as we move into wholeness, as we learn and grow and heal and learn to perceive ourselves and the world through a new and more illuminated lens, we ask, may we serve and may we do whatever we can to come together as a global society to create a planet that is fair and safe and equal and free for all beings everywhere. We ask, may this moment together be, be blessed. Take another very deep breath in. Exhale it out through the mouth. And then open your eyes. Welcome, everyone. So the reason I started you all in prayer is because when we think about the evolution of the soul, it requires first an evolutionary pathway that each individual goes upon, a pathway that is often fraught with challenges based on our karma, our trauma, and our own humanity. The spiritual practice can often be very isolated. It can feel very lonely because it's you, it's your breath, it's your meditation cushion, and it's your mat. And so being able to move towards prayer gives us a moment to connect with what's truly important. And above all, it's love and it's the relationship that we have with the divine. So I want to thank you all for just taking that moment to connect before we launch into this. It also allowed me an opportunity to plant certain seeds with you as we go into this conversation related to yoga, um, transformational inner work, social justice, and conscious action. And I wanted, was hoping for you to have an embodied understanding of this before I get into the, the, the theoretical aspect. The reason I was very happy to um, have been asked to be a part of this particular dialogue is because when I was a younger student and most certainly a younger activist, there really wasn't a lot of examples in my life of spiritual leadership that supported activism. Activism usually meant you were against something. It was perceived as being negative, aggressive, um, something where uh, there was anger that drove um, the motivation to create social change. And I knew in my gut, as my yoga practice began to evolve from the me to the we, from the individual to collective, service was an essential and necessary part of my own evolutionary practice and purpose. And I turned towards Ram Dass's work to help to highlight the efforts that were going to be required to speak up and out and to push back a bit, if you will, against those in the spiritual, spiritual community that were interested only in turning their gaze inward rather than turning that inward gaze outward into the planet where it truly makes a difference. And so by utilizing a lot of his teachings, it also armed me, again, if you will, um, for when people asked me about, well, what is this intersection between yoga and spirituality and, and action? And as a young teacher, it was always really nice to be able to say, well, Ram Dass says, and to be able to basically throw the blame on him and uh, rather than actually have to take the accountability for that myself. And so I'm grateful for leaders like Ram Dass and other teachers. Um, Sri Aurobindo, for example, is another leader um, who's who has also passed, who really um, showed that there was no difference my activism began young, actually, when I first started getting into yoga. But it really did come from a very, very wounded place. Um, it began in New York City in relationship to HIV AIDS. 
And in the 80s, when friends of mine, people that I cared about and loved, were dying, getting ill, and were horrifyingly, um, there was bias and discrimination and prejudice against them because of their sexuality. And some of these people were one, some of my biggest spiritual teachers and helped me to understand about um, acceptance and love and to see the world through a more um, inclusive uh, lens. And so I would often go to rallies and but in these rallies, you would often find me screaming, um, yelling. Um, I would also go to pro-life, uh, excuse me, um, pro-choice rallies and uh, be yelling, screaming. And what I came to realize is that after a rally was done, I felt amazing. I felt lit, excited, amplified until the next day or the day after that and the day or the day after that. And I realized that I was really unsophisticated in my service and decided to pull back and not engage in the same way. And I got into yoga and in the yoga practice, it was not spiritual. It was physical. And for about five years, I would say, all I was interested in is those extra push-ups in the long holds. If a teacher prayed or um, if I had to tolerate Shavasana, it was just one of those experiences where I was polite but I didn't really understand the benefits of any of it. Um, I would have been, I would have considered myself an atheist at that time and would have been uh, rejecting of anything that communicated God or spirituality. There was a moment in my yoga practice where for the first time, the teacher is prattling on about something, you know, love, truth, forgiveness, who knows. But my body exhaled in a way it never exhaled before. And I felt this emotion rise up from deep within that seemed limitless, that seemed infinite, that terrified me because there was nothing wrong in my life. And I left the room, went into the bathroom and cried and cried and cried. And my body shook, literally shook. And when it was over, I went back into the room, got back into a pose and heard the teacher completely differently. Now, the teacher was saying the same thing that they've been probably saying for all those years prior. But for the first time, that tension in my body released to such a capacity that I was actually able to hear it and feel it, not from my head, but from deep within my heart. This set me on a trajectory of wanting to understand the mind-body connection and the way in which trauma impacts the nervous system and influences our perception. So there's a reason why I'm sharing all this with you and taking you on this little bit of a trajectory so that you perhaps can relate it to your own practice. It didn't mean that those years prior to that emotional release were insignificant. My trauma was so big and the tension that I relied on to manage the trauma was so deep that it literally took years of chipping away at the tension with breath, with asana, with mantra, with mudra. Years of letting my central nervous system titrate to the discomfort for me to feel safe enough to get present to the big feelings that were the cause of all that tension. Now, how does this relate to that incident in my younger years of activism? There's no separation between the mind and the body. Everything that we think, feel, or experience has an effect on our central nervous system. Our bodies remember everything. When we experience trauma, um, trauma um, 
when we experience trauma, what happens is whether it's acute trauma, shock trauma, um, developmental trauma, we have a biological, physiological reaction. The event happens. Now, the event could be bullying, death of a loved one, um, finding out your your partner is cheating on you. It could be witnessing violence. It's on a huge spectrum. And what's traumatic for me might not be traumatic for you and vice versa. Very often when we think of trauma, we think of the traumas that are shock traumas. And we then think that our traumas aren't traumatic enough. So we minimize them. The traumas that I want to invite you to really consider is what's called developmental trauma. And these are the traumas that we experience in our youth um, before we really have words to place upon our big feelings. And so you have an experience. You, you um, Someone says or does something that causes you hurt or harm or pain. The body receive, receives those messages. The brain releases chemicals into the body, including stress hormones like um, cortisol and adrenaline. And we go into fight, flight, freeze, or collapse. In that moment that the brain and the body are in communication, that something is wrong, bad, scary, or unsafe, the body to protect itself and to create a container of control contracts. And in that moment of contraction, a samskara is born. Samskaras are the deep grooves of, of perception, of information that live within our body, within our mind. Um, they're historical. They're ancestral. They come from our own living experience. But the moment we have that release of energy into the body, body contracts, boom, there's the imprint. If we were raised in an environment where we are allowed to complete the process of overwhelm, including discharging the residual energy. Energy is defined as vibration with information. Everything is energy, and that includes emotions. And that includes emotions like fear, rage, shame, guilt, grief. So if we're allowed to discharge the experience and the big feelings that we have, if our parents say to us, you know, here's a tennis racket, beat this pillow, use whatever language you want, scream, yell, dance, whatever you need to do. We're able to pass it through, but that's not how we're, a lot of us, some of us are raised that way. A lot of us are not raised that way necessarily. Um, at best, a big feeling comes up, our parents or whoever is uh, our caretakers see that we're scared or angry or sad and say like, oh, you're scared, angry, or sad, here's a cookie. Or let's go shopping, I'll buy you a present. So we get taught to soothe using external means to change the way that we feel. Or they shame us for our big feelings by saying like, oh, you're sad, I'll give you something to be sad about. Either way, we get taught to internalize the emotion and then therefore that energy. That energy becomes tension. Tension, stress, and anxiety become the number one causes of illness, of depression, um, known today. And as, and it's cumulative, meaning that every single time you go up against an experience that in the unconscious reminds you of that original insult or, or assault, your body is going to contract to create control and a barrier of safety. So we do that at six, at eight, at 14, at 22, all the way up until we're in deep into our adult lives. That tension be becomes that armor that we wear that protects us from the world around us and from the invisible forces that tell us the world is an unsafe or an untrusting place to be. So back to the young person screaming and raging. The reason I felt so good after a rally was because I was discharging energy. I was yelling. I was using my voice to express the rage. But the reason a day or two days or three days later, I would go back into feeling anxiety or discomfort was because I wasn't processing the feelings. I wasn't owning them. I wasn't coming into an understanding. I was staying in the rage. But what's underneath the anger is always going to be grief. And that is what the revolution of the soul is all about. 
It's doing the deep inner work necessary on ourselves, is recognize the ways in which our body holds on to the historical, ancestral, and personal trauma, and the ways in which these traumas influence our health and our wellness, cause the, some scars that influence our perception, and keep us stuck and scared um, and resistant to personal change. Therefore, how can we then move towards any kind of global change? Yoga and meditation, prayer, therapy, the program, there are all these different kinds of ways in which we can utilize these tools to take accountability for our own personal narrative and the ways in which we've become attached to those narratives, the addiction that we have to those narratives, and why it's so hard to break them. You see, this body, this body understands control. This body understands trauma. This body doesn't understand what's on the other side of that control. That's why yoga and many of these spiritual practices are so challenging, because they ask us to surrender all that we think we know. They ask us to believe in a higher power that exists beyond our own limited perception. They invite us to recognize and befriend the shadow aspects of our life, all the pain, the suffering, the experiences that we have had, and look at them as opportunities for growth and spiritual maturation. And then use that wisdom in a way to be able to be in service to the world around us with empathy and with deep, deep care. Otherwise, what we will do in our service is we will try to fix and change that which feels intolerable because we haven't healed that in that feeling of intolerableness, if you will, within ourselves. The yoga practice allows us to discharge the energy. It allows us to then orient towards the belief systems that we carry. See a bigger picture of why things happen as they do without bypassing the animal energy of our own humanity. And when we begin to cultivate a deeper relationship to why things happen as they have, when we can actually see the spiritual possibility, even in the devastation, even in the incomprehensible, but the grace, it's in those moments where we begin to forgive ourselves for thinking that we should have known better, forgive others, for thinking they should have known better, recognize that we're all doing the best we can with what little we know based on our own trauma and the lack of tools that have been available to us at any given time. It's in those moments that we begin to cut the cords that bind us to these narratives and to our ego and have compassion and love and empathy for our own humanity and the complexities of the human experience. That is the moment in which we can orient ourselves towards the world around us and recognize that this world is in trauma, that everything that is happening right now is happening because people do not have the skills or the tools to do their deep inner work. And when people are in trauma without the tools, they will meet hate with hate and fear with fear, or there's going to be an ego power dynamic, meaning if you feel powerless, you're going to want to feel power over. Either way, your impulse is to going to create division, domination, oppression. Domination and oppression is the very disease that's creating so much of the fracture that exists, certainly within the United States, but all over this world. And if we want to heal, if we're outraged by those fractures, by those divisions of power, if we're outraged by the racism, sexism, the homophobia, the transphobia, um, the ageism, the ableism, all the ways where there is inequality and bias and discrimination and prejudice, then there is only one true spiritual practice that we can do right now is to recognize the ways in which we have internalized our own racism, racist beliefs, sexist beliefs, homophobic, transphobic, ageist, ableist beliefs, um, because we have. None of us are exempt. Otherwise, we would be enlightened. But because we inherit the trauma, we also inherit the belief systems. So I might not be actively walking through this world racist, but if this body gets triggered, activated, and I contract, and I am no longer in present time, and I get scared, 
I am going to time travel in my mind to a belief system that is a part of my culture, part of my religion, part of my education. And it's going to be effortless because it lived, it lives longer in my body than awareness does, than compassion does, than empathy does. And so our first course of true activism is committing to the inner work, being really, really brave, going back and looking at what what information did you learn about the world? What are the samskaras that exist for you personally based on your location, your socioeconomic status, the color of your skin, your own sexuality, your own gender? How has all of that influenced the way in which you experience the world and the way in which the world experiences you? And be so committed to authenticity, honesty, radical accountability, which is really, really hard. Trust me, it is way easier to blame others for their racism and homophobia and bias and prejudice than it is to take accountability for your own. And yet, I believe in my soul that if we are going to make a difference in this world, then we, all of us, and it has nothing to do with your strength or your flexibility or how long you can even sit quietly on your, on your, on your meditation cushion, it has to do with a willingness to recognize that as a global society, because of this unearthed trauma, we are heading in a trajectory that is causing great pain and suffering to, to way too many people. And I have learned through the practice of yoga that ahimsa, which is often translated to do no harm, also means to disrupt harm when you see it, that it is our responsibility to orient towards the suffering that exists within this world. Otherwise, we are complicit to that suffering. It is our responsibility to heal these divides because as yoga teaches us, our liberation is bound. And so if you're committed to this practice of spiritual growth and maturation, activism is an inevitable part of the experience and very often, the very trauma, not always, but often, the very trauma that brought you to your mat or to your, your meditation cushion is the place in which you will be most needed to serve because of your experience and your wisdom and your empathy and because of all the ways you have walked that path, who better than you to be able to support someone else as they walk through their own similar, albeit different, uh, pathway. And so this is the work that must be done. Um, I'm just going to do a really quick time check just to make sure I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. And so I think I'll, how much more time do I have? Give me a little, oh, I'm good. Okay. And so in the meditation, what I offered you, I asked you first just to ground, just to, how are you? Just to really ask yourself that question and get, and get real with it because it changes every day. And that's the first thing we have to do. We have to first orient towards the me. How are you? How is my life? How is my family? What are the emotions that I'm feeling today? Who's showing up for me in my meditation? Where does this live in my body as a felt experience? What's the sensation in my body? Because anger or fear or grief, um, these are not sensations. These are emotions. But their sensations might include tightness in the jaw, redness in the face, beating of the heart, numbness in the fingers. You might get sensations that alert you that you're actually sad or scared or angry. And it gives you a chance before you get reactive, before you go out into the world and want to discharge that energy out onto your partner or on your kids or your coworkers or even in your activism. It gives you a chance then to put your hands on your heart and on your belly, to take a moment to remember who you truly are, to remember that you're not this body, that you're not the stories you tell yourself are true. You're not your trauma. You're not your history. You are not your fear. You're not the abandonment that you experienced. You're not your alcoholism or your sexual abuse or your homosexuality or any aspect because that's all they are. They are aspects of our journey, important, necessary, but they're not who you truly are. 
And so we have that moment to acknowledge all these different aspects of our personality, our ego, the social masks we wear. Um, and then we go in and we remember that we are light and we are love and we are an, and we are a mortal grace and that we are children of God and that we are here in these bodies to learn what love is. And the rate in which that happens is between each soul and the God of their own understanding. And it is our work to unpack the belief systems that are blocking us from the totality of that knowing. And each day, then we go back up into our mind where we recognize that truth and love is what leads to the wisdom and calling our power back from the attachments that we have to our personal stories is what's going to allow us to open our mind to receive the, the, the internal guidance that brings us home to ourself. And when we have those flashes, and believe me, it's a flash. If, uh, it takes lifetimes to be able to live in this grace, uh, um, for long, long stretches, but you get a glimpse of who you truly are and you feel your whole body exhale. And in that moment, you remind yourself that what you just experienced past all of the identification and the masks we wear, that same light dwells within all souls. And so the revolution of the soul begins with the evolution of the soul. Our own personal evolution is an essential part, but we can't wait until we're completely healed. Otherwise, trust me, none of us would do anything. It happens simultaneously. Then we look outward and we recognize that we must engage, we must act. And especially with everything that is happening in our world today, from COVID to racial terrorism, to white supremacy culture, to political unrest, to all of the wars that are being fought throughout this world. We must do all that we can, whether it's pray each day or align ourselves with organizations that we believe in or run for office ourselves, or vote vote out of office, the people who benefit from the systems that oppress, replace those people because the systems are corrupt, but systems are made up of people. Change the people, we change the system. And so that's what I'm inviting myself to do. I hope you'll join me, but I know that this is my commitment. I want to change this person. I want to do all I can to, to understand the limits of beliefs that block me from my own light and keep me separate from myself, from this planet, from you and from God. And as I heal that and remember who I am, I'll remember who you are and who we are to each other. And if we can do that as a collective society, if we put love and truth and activate that in all that we do say and, and, and create, peace is the inevitable outcome. And so I'll, I think I'll leave you with that and my dog barking. <laughs> I think you can hear him in the background. Um, yeah. So, so thank you all very much. And, um, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to share this with you because this is what gets me on my mat every day. And it's what gives me hope for our society because more and more people are doing yoga and meditating and praying and connecting to source and getting healed. And, um, the power of love will always be greater than the power of fear. Mm hmm. Hallelujah. Thank you so much. There was so much packed into that. And I really appreciate how you just concisely bring all these various pieces together. And mm -hmm. it's in a way that just there's a big yes. So I think there's a lot of people out there feeling that as well. Thank you. Yeah. And there, there's so much I want to say in response to some of the things. So I'll just um, we'll start and I want everyone out there to know um, you probably got a lot of information and might have some questions and curiosity. So please put those in the chat and then they'll come to me and we'll um, pass them along to Sean. Uh, but to get us started, um, there's a quote. This is the hardest. One of the three hardest things to do is to return hate with love. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, and we can only learn to do that when we really drop into ourselves and learn to love ourselves, which is what you were saying. Mm -hmm. Um 
And that means getting really real with ourselves. Sharon Salzberg is uh, helped us kick off the the course that's coming out on kindness. And she says that every day she wakes up, she sits down and she gets real. And part of the getting real is recognizing not only the grief and the anger, but the sense of powerlessness Mm -hmm. that a lot of people feel um, in this day and age. And that's the piece that we often don't want to want to feel. Yeah. Yeah. So do you have anything to say about that? Um, I start off most days Mm -hmm. um, similarly to Sharon, but with a little bit of a different edge. Um, I write fuck you letters (laughs) and (laughs) (laughs) um, because of my my history of trauma, Mm -hmm. I'm uh, very quick to dissociate. And also because of the amount of tools that I've been given through yoga and therapy over the years, I also have the ability to over understand, meaning Mm -hmm. I can tell you how I feel, but not actually feel anything. And so because I'm a dissociator and because I understand my trauma, I know that I have to first touch the rage and then try and do that so I can get to the grief so that I'm in my body. And so that I do that by finding out, like, it doesn't take me very long. Um, And it's usually at this point in my life, it's usually related to something that's going on politically. Um, I write my my fuck you letters and I don't say anything spiritual. I purge the animal. I say all the judgment, the grossest, ugliest things that you could ever imagine coming from this body. I put it on the piece of paper so that I can purge it Um, because that's very important. Again, remember I said earlier, everything is energy. And energy is vibration with information. And if I'm not discharging it, it has no place to go but stay in my body. So if I'm not getting that 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 fuck you out, it's going to get leaky. It's somebody is going to to feel that, but probably in a passive aggressive way. And so I was taught you can't get to the bless you without going through the fuck you. And so I write my FU letters. And then there's other exercises that I do, Uh, depending on what it is, I might then write, I'm angry because, and same thing, I just perch until I'm letting myself feel. And then I might write, I'm scared because, and then journal write about that until I can get to, I'm sad because, and that's Mm -hmm. usually the truth. Um, Sometimes in the FU letters, I will, after I'm done writing it everywhere that I've used someone's name or uh, a you. I cross it out and I put me so that I can try to identify the things that I'm projecting onto someone else that I haven't yet really dealt with in myself to see if there's some things that I need to clean up. And there always is. Mm. Um, And that also really helps me. And this then allows me to honor my humanity, honor the the little girl in me that is out, that is outraged and wasn't giving a given a voice for that outrage and then allows me to recognize that the person that I am feeling this about, they are in trauma, zero skills, are struggling with their own lack of self and insecurity and worthlessness, Mm. are making choices to feel better about who they are because they're looking for power in all the ways outside of themselves and there's never enough of anything to feel full. And so the only way they can feel better is by making others feel worse. And I try to remind myself, I know how that feels to a degree, not to that extreme, but I know how that feels. I can have empathy for the broken soul inside of that person or persons or circumstance. That doesn't mean I condone their behavior and it doesn't mean I let them get away with their behavior, but it does temper the way in which I approach that person or that circumstance so that I can have some humanity, some compassion in my heart. Um, That's the way in which I have approached my activism. And the truth is, sometimes it works, sometimes it does not. And I have been known to be reactive and have had to be accountable for that and deal with it. Um, And thankfully, the yoga practice, the rate in which I stay in my own stuckness gets shorter and shorter and shorter. Yeah, that's great. That's such a great example of how to move through it. Um, And one of the things that came up uh, is around the tools that you have around navigating trauma. And a lot of people don't have those tools. So can you give some some 
thoughts or advice of like when when it starts to the overwhelm comes, then we get hijacked yeah. um, by the trauma because it's really hard to like do these steps and be in our rational mind when we're hijacked. Sure. Yeah. What when you say hijacked, it, what's happening is that the central nervous system that's responsible or the vagus nerve that runs from the brainstem all the way through the body, and there's this constant communication going on when the when the parasympathetic sympathetic nervous system gets turned off and the sympathetic nervous system gets activated, um, we stay on on. When you say hijacked, it's like the light switch is on and we become hypervigilant, experience anxiety, nervousness, sleeplessness, reactivity. Um, we might then at that point want to use substances to help to ground us or soothe us. Um, mm -hmm. And that includes all sorts of things, sex, drugs, alcohol, TV, internet shopping. Um, when you're feeling activated or triggered, there are cert certain things that you can do. One, of course, is to breathe. But even prior to that, ground, look around the room and you want to identify maybe five red or green objects that you see. That usually, that action of moving your head, of shifting your eyes, mm. will immediately start to calm you. There is a technique of where you there's you look for five things that you can see, four things that you can hear, three things that you can smell, two things that you can uh, uh, touch, and one thing that you can taste. Mm. And that often can bring you back into some level of homeostasis, some balance, some equanimity. I've also found the there's a five finger meditation technique because it's tactile, mm. meaning that the sensation along with the breath um, is soothing. And what it requires is you put up your hand, you put one finger at the very base of your, your thumb, all the way at the bottom of the wrist, and you inhale, tracing the line of the thumb until you get to the very top. And then you exhale all the way down to the bottom and then you inhale all the way to the top and you continue that way and then you repeat it in the other direction. The feeling of your own skin and the way in which the skin here is very sensitive, it's very, it's a nice feeling, can also help to um, tone the vagus nerve and help to ground. Feet on the floor, hands on the heart, um, calling a friend, talking it through, these are some of the ways in which we can um, de-escalate the overwhelm and help the parasympathetic nervous system, the rest and digest part of us, come back into the into play. Yoga, of course, meditation, breath work, um, depending on the breath work. Uh, and if the, if the trauma is feeling acute, please get support. Please find a therapist. A somatic therapist is excellent. Um, because it under they they often understand body based trauma and help mm -hmm. it. so it's not just from the the neck up it's really dealing with the sensation of the body so these are some of the ways in which we can manage manage uh, activation in the moment that can help us come back into a sense of groundedness yeah those are great um, when you were talking about the hand meditation um, it also reminded me because when we talk about hijack I think most of us think of like the anxious part of trauma, but there's also the, the freeze, the shutdown part. Mm -hmm. And, um, I know with somatic experiencing, one of the things is when you're really shut down, which might show up as like just watching TV and not having any like energy is to like squeeze or like mm -hmm. walk to the end of the block and just, that's it. Yeah. Um, so just app because I, the way I use the word hijack, I think it gets people into that thinking of the anxiety state, but yep. there's the other state as well to really be aware of. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the you mentioned overwhelm as well and so there's not only the personal overwhelm that happens from our own trauma um but it, this this idea so i did a um helped lead a course recently it was called a global mystics course and um one of the reasons so many people signed up was because one of the chapters was on sacred activism and so many people wanted to learn about sacred activism which is what we're talking about and what one of the comments that's up over and over again, and you, you spoke to this to some degree, but I'm hoping you'll spoke, speak to it a, a little bit more, 
was um, this idea. It's so much like, you know, climate crisis, all, you know, all of these things. It's so much. What's my little piece and the overwhelm that happens from that. Can you yeah. speak more into that maybe? Or Yeah. Um, I, I, and I hear that a lot too. people yeah. they don't know what to do. There's too much to do. And I always say, don't reinvent the wheel. Um, look to see what is it that is important to you? What breaks your heart and find an organization that's already doing that and see what they need. Um, it might be money. It might be to stuff envelopes. It might, you might find that you're really good at spreadsheets. There might be a skill that you have that doesn't take too much time from your day. Um, you might be raising your family right now. This is not the time for you to like go to um, you know, fly out to Washington to do a mass protest or to get on an airplane and go somewhere else in the world. You've got a different level of service that's essential where your presence is needed. But there might be other things that you can do um, that can be helpful. But if you try to bite off more than you can chew, usually what I experience is people get overwhelmed and then they just quit. They just give up. And it's like I mentioned, for some, not for all, you go to where your wound is. Um, and I write about this, that in my book, Revolution of the Soul, my first real act of service after, you know, my, when I was young, when I was a protester, was working at Children of the Night with children who were, um, who are, who are sex trafficked and severely sexually abused. I thought, oh, that'll be a great place to go teach. You know, they, I'm sure they, they probably have some body issue, uh, uh, some body image issues and some, uh, stress. So naive, especially because my trauma is sexual abuse. So I walk into that environment thinking I'm going to go help somebody and I meet 15 examples of my disowned self and I hated what I saw. I wanted to get out of there so fast. And because though I did have a spiritual practice, I recognized that those ch children had something to teach me, something that was going to help me reclaim those mm -hmm. fractured parts of myself. And maybe in the meantime, I can teach them some skills of self-regulation. But truth be told, I got way more out of it, I think, than they did. Yeah. I was ready at that point. I was already confronting my trauma. And so to put myself there, uh, it, it felt in my soul like I can do this. And now, all these years later, working with children in that capacity is the place where I'm most relaxed, most present, most confident, and feel that I can actually make a difference. Um, because although our experiences obviously are not the same, there is a, a level of, um, of loss that I can speak to, the loss of the, the child self, um, and tools for empowerment without trying to get the, the, the young people to think that that, um, that that experience could have, should have been any other way. You can't change what is, but you can change your perspective. And I was able to do that. I can offer that to others. And so people have experienced domestic violence, alcoholism, drug abuse, divorce, loss of a child, God forbid. Um, when you're ready, those might be places where you're best at service. Now, with that said, I have been an animal rights activist for years. It is probably more important to me than anything else. Mm -hmm. I could never step foot in a factory farm. I can't even watch films where I see the abuse. My nervous system cannot handle it. I get overwhelmed and I make it all about me. I, I cannot. I am useless. I know that about me. So therefore, that is where I give my money. That is where I give money to people whose nervous systems are aligned, who can do that work. They need the resources. I'll give them the resources. Whereas in the areas that I am attuned, that's where I go and other people give me the resources. So it like kind of it all flows. And so I, I offer this to people that like, what breaks your heart? What brings you joy? Um, what are the skills that you already have and what are the organizations already doing this so that you don't have to create your own nonprofit, um, and be in service to people who have these other organizational skills where it can make a broader difference. Yeah, that's so helpful. 
I want to mention to everyone out there, if you haven't read your book, it's an amazing book, Revolution of the Soul. Um, and just that helping piece, you know, Ramdas has the book, um, how can how can I help? And that for me, this idea that we're all hungry for something and we all have something to give. And when we come together, like that, what you were saying earlier, like they helped me as much as I helped them. Mm -hmm. um, I also, I love that you talked about the spreadsheet because I think we have, one of the things that gets in the way of our sacred activism is this idea of the hero, like someone's going to be the hero. I've got to be the hero and do it all. Right. And if I can't do that, then I'm doing nothing. But I think of like Rosa Parks, right? Like there were people ready with like flyers to put around the community. Like it was a, it was a movement mm -hmm. and there was someone who made the cop, you know, made the, drew it out and wrote the copy and made the copies and the people that handed it out, all of those pieces matter. Yeah. And so like this, if you're showing up for spreadsheets, you know, that's one of the 10,000 arms of the goddess, right? Like yes. and it's just so important to bring that message home and mm -hmm. over and over again. So we get out of that hero complex around these things. Yeah. That's a really important point. Yeah. Yeah. So I appreciate that. Um, so there's a couple of questions that have come in from um, this one's from our live stream and it's from CB asking, how do I handle people in my life that are seemingly angry, upset, or living in fear? Um, with and not like I can't avoid them, but I don't want them to sort of bring me down. Huh? I mean, processing. I, if these are people in your family, you, you, you are going to have to navigate those relationships and establish boundaries, how much you can tolerate, how much you can't tolerate, how much time you're willing to spend, but you can't reject your family necessarily. If it's friends, um, and these people are no longer serving your health, your happiness, and they're becoming energy vampires, the, the relationship might need to become something else. Um, you also want to check in with your own addiction to mm -hmm. uh, negative people. Very often we surround ourselves with negative people so that we can be so irritated at their bad behavior that we don't actually have to deal with our own. And uh, I've been guilty of that in my own past where it's like, uh, oh, that person, they need to change. And I've got all the reasons why. And realizing that I'm actually orienting to these communities because it's keeping me from actually having to do the inner work. Um, but it's I, without having specifics, it's a hard question to answer because there's too many complexities that go with it. I come from the belief that everyone is our teacher and that there's not a single moment that doesn't give us fodder for spiritual growth and maturation. And if someone is triggering me, uh, if I have to be in their lives, then it's going to invite me to have to find very skilled ways to communicate differently, um, to set boundaries, uh, to take space, to find ways of engagement that are mindful, that are mutually understood. Um, or like I said, it might be time to cut people out of your lives with love because they're just causing too much hurt and harm and grief. But I hope, uh, CB, you still get the lesson. Who are they? Why are they in their life? Who do they remind you of? Um, usually goes back to your childhood. We attract people to us who are representative of the power dynamics from our youth. And so it might not be them that you're annoyed with, but you know, your dad. <laughs> and so it's one of the ways in which we can explore it. I'm really glad that you brought up boundaries too, because uh, just to bring Ram Dass in a little bit, there's the um, do what you do with another person, but never kick them out of your heart. Yeah. Um, so, and that he brings that up a lot around like rallies and, and activism. Um, but I think it really applies to families as well. And this idea of not kicking someone out of our heart doesn't mean we have to like be sappy in love, but like love includes boundaries, yeah. love. And it, so it's again, one of those really important points. Yeah. Like I always say like, you know, I have to forgive. It doesn't mean I have to have lunch with the person, but yeah. I do have to give them back to God. I do have to see the child within them. And I have to recognize that they are also here to learn what love is. And when the rate in which that happens is between them and the God un of their own understanding. And I need to stay on my own side of the street. Yeah. I do have to hold that light. It's like I say in my book, ignore the story and see the soul, but re and remember to love, you'll never regret it. That we all have a story, but that's not who we are. It's yeah. aspects of our personality. The soul, though, 
is perfect and infinite and beautiful and wondrous and that we can celebrate. Yeah. Uh, Krishna Das recently uh, was talking about Ram Das and he was like, he said, Ram Das said, my personality does not like your personality right now, but my, as a soul, I love you. Yeah. <laughs> and I love that. That's perfect. <laughs> yeah. so what I love about that is just the honoring of the humanity, because I feel like, especially within the spirituality realm, we think we really have, we give our humanity a really hard time mm. um, as though it has no place in the spiritual practice at all. And yet yoga teaches us about wholeness, that everything is connected, I have to befriend my shadow. It's what's teaching me patience and compassion and love. Um, if I reject my shadow, I remain split and divided, and I cannot love your shadow. When I love my shadow, I'm going to see yours through a different lens. And so, and again, don't have, to, my personality might not like yours. <laughs> and my soul. Vice versa, yeah. And unless my soul is in engagement, then I'm the problem. Yeah, yeah. Um, Sharon recently said, uh, it's, this is actually Bob Thurman's story where uh, talking about meta as this actually as uh, interconnectedness and um, like imagine that you're on a subway car and you just get stuck there for life with all the people. You don't have to necessarily like them, yeah. um, but if someone's hungry, you feed them. And if someone's upset, you sue them to, you know, within those boundaries. Um, but I, I like that as a, that metaphor as well. Um, let's see, there's something else that came up, but it left my head. So, um, can you talk about forgiveness a little bit? How do we really step into forgiveness? It is, it takes time. And when you forgive, you forgive again and again and again, and you forgive yourself for thinking you should have known better and for your inability to forgive. And so it's never a really a one and done. Um, it's very hard when you're talking. It, it's easy for me to like, you know, forgive my you know ex-boyfriend for deceiving me is a different level of forgiveness than forgiving the person who perpetrated abuse upon me. That's a different level of forgiveness and one that really does require a full body release but both are equal in their importance because the inability to forgive, it's an energy, just like everything else. It's a caustic contracting energy. And as it's very oft quoted, it's a poison that I take hoping someone else will die. And so it only makes me sicker and sicker and more and more shut down within myself. And in some cases, it's an, uh, an energy that feels righteous it feels good. It feels empowered. It feels like I'm not going to let them off the hook. It's the only way that I can make them feel worthless in the way that I felt worthless is by holding it over them that they are a piece of shit, unlovable, unforgivable. And when I always try to imagine is odds are they're kind of getting on with their life. Odds are they're doing their thing, maybe even fell in love. Maybe they've got their own issues and struggles, but they're probably not as invested in the story as we are. They might be, but in their own way. So we're holding that contraction. So it's an energetic cord that gets cut. Their, it's, it becomes a part of their karma that they will continually play out and repeat again and again and again until they get the lesson. It's none of our business. It is none of our concern. We've got to make sure that we're whole and intact and we love ourselves so much that their opinion of us, their experience of us doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is how we feel about ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so, and with that said, when I'm working, especially if I'm working with some, with young adults, I want them angry. I don't want them forgiving too soon. I don't even want to mention it. I want them saying, I, I want to sit there with a cup of tea and say, and, and what else? Tell me more. What else? And let them say all the things again and again and again until their body gets accustomed to the words, until their nervous system becomes so familiar with it that it's out. Then, maybe then, 
First, I would ask them perhaps to forgive themselves for all the ways in which they abandoned, rejected, betrayed, neglected, lied, or deceived themselves. Then maybe in time, I would invite them to forgive themselves for the ways in which they neglected, rejected, denied, deceived, betrayed someone else, because we all have. Mm -hmm. And then maybe in time, I would invite them just to play with the idea of what it would feel like in their body to forgive the person who caused harm. And maybe I would ask them first to visualize that person as a little child and forgive that little child. And I would let them go like, okay, at what age do you stop forgiving them? It's usually when they start like 18, 19, when they're adults. Um, But it lets them have a relationship with that being on a soul level, slowly chipping away at the resentment And so I never want to say with forgiveness, it's like, yes, it's the highest spiritual thing that we can do. It is a deep spiritual practice that requires a lot of time, energy, effort, probably support of a therapist to help you to manage the feelings that might come up around it, making sure you're not moving too quickly. But I also promise you before the end of your life, it is what you're going to want to do for yourself so that you're not holding any of those tendrils of resentment so that you can feel that liberation within yourself. Um, It is essential, but it takes time. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I think that needs to be heard over and over again, in part because of this tendency to spiritually bypass, right? Like I want to be spiritual. I have to hurry up and forgive. And like what that, the toxicity that does in our own system to like shove all the feelings down, um, just sort of perpetuates our own trauma (coughs) internally. Um, yeah, so thank you. I know there's been, I'm just going to add one, one piece, uh, around forgiving oneself. Like when one finally gets there, I know I had a really hard time with various aspects and I couldn't do it. So I had to like, assume there was an energy of forgiveness in the world and that I could just tap into that and it would do it for me at some point. Um, I love that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I love that because it does it does allow you to depersonalize from it. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't feel as um doesn't hurt in the same way. So I I love the uh, the idea of that. I think that's important. Yeah. And and I think it's important right now in the world. You know, the last 2 years have been incredibly painful for all of us in different ways. Um our foundation has been fractured. We recognize the Im- how important community is, how um how bound we are. The virus proved that, that there are no states or borders or countries. It's um, that there is this interdependence and it relies on all of us to come together to, to heal that. And the pandemic shined a real light on what collective care looks like. Mm. And people experienced real grief and loss loss of lives, uh, proms missed, funerals missed, um, hospital visits uh, not allowed, um, education thwarted, first kisses missed, Mm. like so many things that happened over the past couple of years, isolation, um, issues with resources, recognizing that our leadership, um, is really indifferent to the collective and, um, really hell bent on on power and carelessness uh a very intense and a very scary time and uh we're really seeing how our individual and the collective trauma here in the united states has is it's rising to the surface um we need practices of resilience more than ever i mean it is I can understand why people would want to pull the covers up over their head right now and be like, I don't want to deal with spirituality. I don't want to take accountability. I don't want to serve. I can barely get out of my bed and make food, let alone like think about the perceived other as being an extension of my own ever evolving soul. Like, but, and I say this really to the teachers who are out there that are listening right now, do your work, stay in community, keep your relationship with the divine Um, don't lose faith. Don't lose hope. Your, your presence is going to be the fuel that's going to help to soothe other people so that they can show up and serve their children, their families, and their communities. It's in some ways we're starting from scratch 
and really reinvesting ourselves in our spiritual practice and Mm -hmm. forgiving forgiving our families for thinking differently than we do, forgiving the wellness world for thinking differently, forgiving the politicians for thinking differently, and really recognizing this division and knowing in our heart that that repair is necessary if we're going to go forward. But repair can't happen unless we're resourced. And we have to take a loving accountability of what's going on within ourselves so that we can repair this and then work towards repairing the whole. Mm, the both and approach. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Reminds me of the, um, the Maharaji quote of, um, food come or God comes to the hungry in the form of food. Mm. Right. So the, all the different ways that God is going to show up, yep. um, and that we can't be preaching, mm. you know, enlightenment, uh, when we're hungry, there's, there's mm-hmm. actions that need to be met there. So this has been such an incredible conversation. I really appreciate your authenticity and your, your clarity and your vulnerability and just all of the aspects you uh, bring in. And it reminds me what I wanted to say earlier, which is uh, I think one of the reasons so many people out there watching resonate with Ramdas is because of that owning of our neuroses. Yeah. You know, I think about like he was leading psychologists. He did hundreds of psychedelic trips. He spent 50 plus years doing spiritual work. And at the end, he's like, I still have the same neuroses. I just now invite them in for tea. Right. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I do. I hope that everyone who who is listening can remind themselves of that again and again and again. If we wait for per- perfection, we're going to be waiting for lifetimes and lifetimes and lifetimes. We have to befriend befriend all aspects of ourself and we might actually develop a different relationship with them and it's one of the reasons why i i did love ram das so much especially as an east coast jewish young woman <laughs> um i it was important for me to see models like that that looked like my family mm. that sounded like my family mm. that interested in things that made sense to me like psychology mm. um at a time like um uh, uh, LSD, um, yeah. mushrooms, it, 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 certainly that's not a part of my life anymore, but at a time, um, that was what would ex- expanded my consciousness. And I remember when I watched Ram Dass's film, um, after he had his stroke, um, fierce grace, grace yeah. fierce grace, the, it helped me when my father was dying of cancer. Mm-hmm that there was, I mean, my father once said to me, you and I are having two different experiences of my cancer and my experience is none of your business. Mm -hmm. And meaning that he was on a deep journey, a spiritual journey. And so was I, and they were two different experiences, one equally as valuable as the other, but different and human, raw, painful, Mm -hmm. gritty, Mm -hmm. but filled with possibility. And in Fierce Grace, it really showed when he talked about getting stroked. Mm. Uh, it gave me so much insight that even in our fragilest moments, even towards the end, there's not a single experience that doesn't open us to God. It doesn't mean you don't get the stroke. It doesn't mean you don't get the cancer. But it yeah. does mean when you get the stroke, when you get the cancer, you're able to feel into it and see the possibility, even in the devastation, even in the fear. Yeah. The dark night of the soul leads to a mature spirituality. Yeah. 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 So it, this is, I hope everyone out there has gotten as much from this as I have on so many layers from the in, you know, individual personal to the, how do I show up for sacred activism? And I really do hope everyone's out there, you know, blending those two and getting out and voting and, you know, doing the things imperfectly, but doing them anyway. So yes, please vote, 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 vote. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So a big, big, big thank you to you and all the wisdom that you bring. And I also want to give a thank you to our back end folks, Gina and JR, that makes this possible. And a big thank you to all of you out there. Um, know that you can rewatch this and send it to your friends to watch if you go to ramdas.org slash live stream dash replays. Uh, our next one is October 3rd with Jayu Tal. 
Uh, don't forget that we meet tomorrow for our virtual meetup where we'll be talking about Ramdas here now last episode. You can sign up for that at ramdas.org slash fellowship. All of these things are free, but if you do want to donate, which is really helpful, you can text Satsang to 91999 or Gina will put things in the chat. Um, I also, how do people find you, Sean? At seancorn.com. Um, yeah. is the best way. And um, if they want to know more about what I said, everything that I said um, is in my book, Revolution of the Soul. And it's an amazing book. I read it uh, two, two or three. I don't know when it came out, but at least two years ago, and it was fabulous. Thank you. Yeah. And I also just want to remind everyone that we there's still another week to sign up for the Foundations of Kindness course. And if you liked what we talked about today, you're going to really love this course. I think it's one of the favorite that I have worked on. And it's Ram Dass and archival footage with um, Joseph Goldstein and Jack Cornfield and Sharon Salzberg and Roshi Joan Halifax. And we have some live components. It's available sliding scale with no one turned away for lack of funds. So it's just a great way to really sort of dive into this the whole practice of how do we show up with kindness in this world, which includes boundaries and all of these other things we talked about. So again, big, big thank you. And we will end with just a lovely namaste and blessings. God bless everyone.